The White Album by Joan Didion, 1979. 1. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. The princess is caged in the consulate. The man with the candy will lead the children into the sea. The naked woman on the ledge outside the window on the 16th floor is a victim of accident. Or the naked woman is an exhibitionist, and it would be interesting to know which. We tell ourselves that it makes some difference whether the naked woman is about to commit a mortal sin or is about to register a political protest, or is about to be the Aristophanic view, snatched back to the human condition by the fireman in priest's clothing just visible in the window behind her, the one smiling at the telephoto lens. We look for the sermon in the suicide, for the social or moral lesson in the murder of five. We interpret what we see, select the most workable of the multiple choices. We live entirely, especially if we are writers, by the imposition of a narrative line upon disparate images, by the ideas with which we have learned to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria which is our actual experience. Or at least we do for a while. I am talking here about a time when I began to doubt the premises of all the stories I had ever told myself. A common condition, but one I found troubling. I suppose this period began around 1966 and continued until 1971. During those five years, I appeared, on the face of it, a competent enough member of some community or another. A signer of contracts and air travel cards, a citizen. I wrote a couple of times a month for one magazine or another, published two books, worked on several motion pictures, participated in the paranoia of the time, in the raising of a small child, and in the entertainment of large numbers of people passing through my house made gingham curtains for spare bedrooms, remembered to ask agents if any reduction of points would be pari passu with the financing studio, put lentils to soak on Saturday night for lentil soup on Sunday, made quarterly FICA payments and renewed my driver's license on time, missing on the written examination only the question about the financial responsibility of California drivers. It was a time of my life when I was frequently named. I was named godmother to children. I was named lecturer and panelist, colloquist and conferee. I was even named, in 1968, a Los Angeles Times Woman of the Year, along with Mrs. Ronald Reagan, the Olympic swimmer Debbie Meyer, and ten other California women who seemed to keep in touch and do good works. I did no good works but I tried to keep in touch. I was responsible. I recognised my name when I saw it. Once in a while I even answered letters addressed to me, not exactly upon receipt, but eventually, particularly if the letters had come from strangers. During my absence from the country these past 18 months, such replies would begin. This was an adequate enough performance, as improvisations go. The only problem was that my entire education, everything I had ever been told or had told myself, insisted that the production was never meant to be improvised. I was supposed to have a script and had mislaid it. I was supposed to hear cues and no longer did. I was meant to know the plot, but all I knew was what I saw. Flash pictures and variable sequence, images with no meaning, beyond their temporary arrangement. Not a movie, but a cutting room experience. In what would probably be the middle of my life, I wanted still to believe in the narrative and in the narrative's intelligibility, but to know that one could change the sense with every cut was to begin to perceive the experience as rather more electrical than ethical. During this period, I spent what were for me the usual proportions of time in Los Angeles and New York and Sacramento. I spent what seemed to many people I knew 
an eccentric amount of time in Honolulu, the particular aspect of which lent me the illusion that I could any minute order from room service a revisionist theory of my own history, garnish with a Vanda orchid. I watched Robert Kennedy's funeral on a veranda at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Honolulu, and also the first reports from Mi Lai. I reread all of George Orwell on the Royal Hawaiian Beach, and I also read in the papers that came one day late from the mainland the story of Betty Lansdowne Fouquet, a 26-year-old woman with faded blonde hair who put her five-year-old daughter out to die on the centre divider of Interstate 5, some miles south of the last Bakersfield exit. The child, whose fingers had to be pried loose from the cyclone fence when she was rescued 12 hours later by the California Highway Patrol, reported that she had run off the car carrying her mother and stepfather and brother and sister for, quote, a long time. Certain of these images did not fit into any narrative I knew. Another flash cut. Quote, In June of this year, patient experienced an attack of vertigo, nausea, and a feeling that she was going to pass out. A thorough medical evaluation elicited no positive findings, and she was placed on Ellaville, 20 milligrams, TID. The raw shark record is interpreted as describing a personality in process of deterioration, with abundant signs of failing defences and increasing inability of the ego to mediate the world of reality and to cope with normal stress. Emotionally, patient has alienated herself almost entirely from the world of other human beings. Her fantasy life appears to have been virtually completely preempted by primitive, regressive, libidinal preoccupations, many of which are distorted and bizarre. In a technical sense, basic affective controls appear to be intact, but it is equally clear that they are insecurely and tenuously maintained for the present by a variety of defense mechanisms, including intellectualization, obsessive compulsive devices, projection, reaction formation, and somatization, all of which now seem inadequate to their task of controlling or containing an underlying psychotic process and are therefore in process of failure. The content of patients' responses is highly unconventional and frequently bizarre, filled with sexual and anatomical preoccupations and basic reality contact is obviously and seriously impaired at times. In quality and level of sophistication, patients' responses are characteristic of those of individuals of high average or superior intelligence. She is now functioning intellectually in impaired fashion at barely average level. Patients' thematic productions on the thematic apperception test emphasize her fundamentally pessimistic, fatalistic, and oppressive view of the world around her. It is as though she feels deeply that all human effort is foredoomed to failure, a conviction which seems to push her further into a dependent, passive withdrawal. In her view, she lives in a world of people moved by strange, conflicted, poorly comprehended, and above all devious motivations, which commit them inevitably to conflict and failure. End quote. The patient to whom the psychiatric report refers is me. The tests mentioned, the raw shark, the thematic apperception test, the sentence completion test, and the Minnesota multiphasic personality index, were administered privately in the outpatient psychiatric clinic at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica in the summer of 1968 shortly after I suffered the, quote, attack of vertigo and nausea mentioned in the first sentence, and shortly before I was named the Los Angeles Times Woman of the Year. By way of comment, I offer only that an attack of vertigo and nausea does not now seem to me an inappropriate response to the summer of 1968. Two. In the years I am talking about, 
I was living in a large house in a part of Hollywood that had once been expensive. I was now described by one of my acquaintances as a, quote, senseless killing neighbourhood. This house on Franklin Avenue was rented and paint peeled inside and out, and pipes broke and window sashes crumbled, and the tennis court had not been rolled since 1933. But the rooms were many and high-ceilinged, and during the five years that I lived there, even the rather sinistral inertia of the neighbourhood tended to suggest that I should live in the house indefinitely. In fact, I could not, because the owners were waiting only for a zoning change to tear the house down and build a high-rise apartment building. And for that matter, it was precisely this anticipation of imminent, but not exactly immediate, destruction that lent the neighbourhood its particular character. The house across the street had been built by one of the town Madge sisters, had been the Japanese consulate in 1941, and was now, although boarded up, occupied by a number of unrelated adults who seemed to constitute some kind of therapy group. The house next door was owned by Synanon. I recall looking at a house around the corner with a rental sign on it. This house had once been the Canadian consulate, had 28 large rooms, and two refrigerated fur closets, and could be rented, in the spirit of the neighbourhood, only on a month-to-month basis, unfurnished. Since the inclination to rent an unfurnished 28-room house for a month or two is a distinctly special one, the neighbourhood was peopled mainly by rock and roll bands, therapy groups, very old women wheeled down the street by practical nurses in soiled uniforms, and by my husband, my daughter, and me. Q. And what else happened, if anything? A. He said that he thought I could be a star, like, you know, a young Burt Lancaster, you know, that kind of stuff. Q. Did he mention any particular name? A. Yes, sir. Q. What name did he mention? A. He mentioned a lot of names. He said Burt Lancaster. He said Clint Eastwood. He said Fess Parker. He mentioned a lot of names. Q. Did you talk after you ate? A. While we were eating, after we ate, Miss Navarro told our fortunes with some cards and he read our palms. Q. Did he tell you you were going to have a lot of good luck or bad luck or what happened? A. He wasn't a good palm reader. These are excerpts from the testimony of Paul Robert Ferguson and Thomas Scott Ferguson, brothers, ages 22 and 17 respectively, during their trial for the murder of Ramon Navarro, aged 69, as house in Laurel Canyon, not too far from my house in Hollywood, on the night of October 30th, 1968. I followed this trial quite closely, clipping reports from the newspapers and later borrowing a transcript from one of the defence attorneys. The younger of the brothers, Tommy Scott Ferguson, whose girlfriend testified that she had stopped being in love with him, quote, about two weeks after grand jury, said that he had been unaware of Mr. Navarro's career as a silent film actor until he was shown, at some point during the night of the murder, a photograph of his host as Ben-Hur. The older brother, Paul Ferguson, who began work in carnivals when he was 12 and described himself at 22 as having had, quote, a fast life and a good one, gave the jury, upon request, his definition of a hustler. Quote, a hustler is someone who can talk, not just to men, to women too, who can cook, can keep company, wash a car. Lots of things make up a hustler. There are lots of lonely people in this town, man. End quote. During the course of the trial, each of the brothers accused the other of the murder. Both were convicted. I read the transcript several times, trying to bring the picture into some focus, which did not suggest that I lived, as my psychiatric report had put it, quote, in a world of people moved by strange, conflicted, poorly comprehended, and above all, devious motivations, end quote. I never met the Ferguson brothers. I did meet one of the principals in another Los Angeles County murder trial 
during those years. Linda Kasabian, star witness for the prosecution of what was commonly known as the Manson trial. I once asked Linda what she thought about the apparently chance sequence of events which had brought her first to the Span Movie Ranch and then to the Sybil Brand Institute for Women on charges later dropped of murdering Sharon Tate Polanski, Abigail Folger, Jay Sebring, Wojtek Rakowski, Stephen Parent, and Rosemary and Leno Labianca. Quote, Everything was to teach me something, Linda said. Linda did not believe that chance was without pattern. Linda operated on what I later recognised as dice theory. And so, during the years I am talking about, did I. It will perhaps suggest the mood of those years, if I tell you that during them I could not visit my mother-in-law without averting my eyes from a framed verse, a house blessing, which hung in a hallway of her house in West Hartford, Connecticut. Quote, God bless the corners of this house, and be the lintel blessed, and bless the hearth, and bless the board, and bless each place of rest, and bless the crystal window pane that lets the starlight in, and bless each door that opens wide to stranger as to kin. End quote. This verse had on me the effect of a physical chill, So insistently did it seem the kind of ironic detail the reporters would seize upon the morning the bodies were found. In my neighbourhood in California, we did not bless the door that opened wide to stranger as to kin. Paul and Tommy Scott Ferguson were the strangers at Ramon Navarro's door, up on Laurel Canyon. Charles Manson was the stranger at Rosemary and Leno LaBianca's door over in Los Feliz. Some strangers at the door knocked and invented a reason to come inside. A call, say, to the AAA about a car not in evidence. Others just opened the door and walked in, and I would come across them in the entrance hall. I recall asking one such stranger what he wanted. We looked at each other for what seemed a long time, and then he saw my husband on the stair landing. Chicken delight, he said finally, but we had ordered no chicken delight, nor was he carrying any. I took the license number of his panel truck. It seems to me now that during those years, I was always writing down the license numbers of panel trucks, panel trucks circling the block, panel trucks parked across the street, panel trucks idling at the intersection. I put these license numbers in a dressing table drawer where they could be found by the police when the time came. That the time would come, I never doubted, at least not in the inaccessible places of the mind where I seemed more and more to be living. So many encounters in those years were devoid of any logic save that of the dream work. In the big house on Franklin Avenue, many people seemed to come and go without relation to what I did. I knew where the sheets and towels were kept, I did not always know who was sleeping in every bed. I had the keys, but not the key. I remember taking a 25 milligram composine one Easter Sunday and making a large and elaborate lunch for a number of people, many of whom were still around on Monday. I remember walking barefoot all day on the worn hardwood floors of that house, and I remember, do you want to dance on the record player? Do you want to dance and visions of Joanna and a song called Midnight Confessions? I remember a babysitter telling me that she saw death in my aura. I remember chatting with her about reasons why this might be so, paying her, opening all the French windows and going to sleep in the living room. It was hard to surprise me in those years. It was hard to even get my attention. I was absorbed in my intellectualization, my obsessive compulsive devices, my projection, my reaction formation, my somatization, and in the transcript of the Ferguson trial. A musician I had met a few years before called from a Ramada Inn in Tuscaloosa 
to tell me how to save myself through Scientology. I had met him once in my life, had talked to him for maybe half an hour about brown rice and the charts, and now he was telling me from Alabama about e-meters and how I might become a clear. I received a telephone call from a stranger in Montreal who seemed to want to enlist me in a narcotics operation. Is it cool to talk on this telephone? He asked several times. Big Brother isn't listening. I said that I doubted it, although increasingly I did not. Because what we're talking about, basically, is applying the Zen philosophy to money and business, dig? And if I say we're going to finance the underground, and if I mention major money, you know what I'm talking about because you know what's going down, right? Maybe he was not talking about narcotics. Maybe he was talking about turning a profit on M1 rifles. I'd stopped looking for the logic in such calls. Someone with whom I had gone to school in Sacramento and had last seen in 1952 turned up at my house in Hollywood in 1968 in the guise of a private detective from West Covina, one of very few licensed women private detectives in the state of California. They call us Dickless Tracys, she said, idly but definitely fanning out the day's mail on the hall table. I have a lot of very close friends in law enforcement, she said then. You might want to meet them. We exchanged promises to keep in touch, but never met again. A not atypical encounter of the period. The 60s were over before it occurred to me that this visit might have been less than entirely social. 3. It was 6, 7 o'clock, of an early spring evening in 1968 when I was sitting on the cold vinyl floor of a sound studio on Sunset Boulevard watching a band called The Doors record a rhythm track. On the whole, my attention was only minimally engaged by the preoccupations of rock and roll bands. Open brackets. I had already heard about Acid as a transitional stage and also about the Maharishi and even about Universal Love and after a while it all sounded like marmalade skies to me. Close brackets. But the doors were different. The doors interested me. The doors seemed unconvinced that love was brotherhood and the Kama Sutra. The doors' music insisted that love was sex, and sex was death, and therein lay salvation. The doors were the Norman Mailers of the Top 40, missionaries of apocalyptic sex. Break on through, their lyrics urged, and light my fire, and come on baby, gonna take a little ride, going down by the ocean side, gonna get real close, get real tight, baby gonna drown tonight, going down, down, down. On this evening in 1968, they were gathered together in uneasy symbiosis, to make their third album, and the studio was too cold, and the lights were too bright, and there were masses of wires and banks of the ominous blinking electronic circuitry with which musicians live so easily. There were three of the four doors. There was a bass player borrowed from a band called Clear Light. There were the producer and the engineer and the road manager and a couple of girls and a Siberian husky named Nicky with one grey eye and one gold. There were paper bags half filled with hard-boiled eggs and chicken livers and cheeseburgers and empty bottles of apple juice and California rosé. There was everything and everybody the Doors needed to cut the rest of this third album except one thing, the fourth door, the lead singer, Jim Morrison a 24-year-old graduate of UCLA who wore black vinyl pants and no underwear and tended to suggest some range of the possible just beyond the suicide pact. It was Morrison who had described the Doors as, quote, erotic politicians. It was Morrison who had defined the group's interests as, quote, anything about revolt, disorder, chaos, about activity that appears to have no meaning. It was Morrison who got arrested in Miami in December of 1967 
for giving an indecent performance. It was Morrison who wrote most of the Doors' lyrics, the peculiar character of which was to reflect either an ambiguous paranoia or a quite unambiguous insistence upon the love death as the ultimate high. And it was Morrison who was missing. It was Ray Manzarek and Robbie Krieger and John Densmore who made the doors sound the way they sounded. And maybe it was Manzarek and Krieger and Densmore who made 17 out of 20 interviewees on American Bandstand prefer the doors over all other bands. But it was Morrison who got up there in his black vinyl pants with no underwear and projected the idea. And it was Morrison they were waiting for now. Hey, listen, the engineer said. I was listening to an FM station on the way over here. They played three door songs. First they played Back Door Man, and then Love Me Two Times, and Light My Fire. I heard it, Densmore muttered. I heard it. So what's wrong with somebody playing three of your songs? This cat dedicates it to his family. Yeah? To his family? To his family? Really crass. Ray Manzarek was harnessed over a Gibson keyboard. You think Morrison's going to come back? He asked to no one in particular. No one answered. So we can do some vocals, Manzarek said. The producer was working with the tape of the rhythm track they had just recorded. I hope so, he said without looking up. Yeah, Manzarek said. So do I. My leg had gone to sleep. But I did not stand up. Unspecific tension seemed to be rendering everyone in the room catatonic. The producer played back the rhythm track. The engineer said that he wanted to do his deep breathing exercises. Manzarek ate a hard-boiled egg. Tennyson made a mantra out of his own name, he said to the engineer. I don't know if he said Tennyson, 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 or Alfred, 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 or Alfred Lord Tennyson. But anyway, he did it. Maybe he just said Lord, Lord, Lord. Groovy, the clear light bass player said. He was an amiable enthusiast, not at all a door in spirit. I wonder what Blake said, Manzarek mused. Too bad Morrison's not here. Morrison would know. It was a long while later. Morrison arrived. He had on his black vinyl pants, and he sat down on a leather couch in front of the four big blank speakers, and he closed his eyes. The curious aspect of Morrison's arrival was this. No one acknowledged it. Robbie Krieger continued working out a guitar passage. John Densmore tuned his drums. Manzarek sat at the control console and twirled a corkscrew and let a girl rub his shoulders. The girl did not look at Morrison, although he was in her direct line of sight. An hour or so passed and still no one had spoken to Morrison. Then, Morrison spoke to Manzarek. He spoke almost in a whisper, as if he were resting the words from behind some disabling aphasia. It's an hour to West Covina, he said. I was thinking maybe we should spend the night out there after we play. Manzarek put down the corkscrew. Why? he said, instead of coming back. Manzarek shrugged. We were planning to come back. Well, I was thinking we could rehearse out there. Manzarek said nothing. We could get in a rehearsal. There's a holiday inn next door. We could do that, Manzarek said, or we could rehearse Sunday in town. I guess so, Morrison paused. Will the place be ready to rehearse Sunday? Manzarak looked at him for a while. 
No, he said then. I counted the control knobs on the electronic console. There were 76. I was unsure in whose favour the dialogue had been resolved, or if it had been resolved at all. Robbie Krieger picked at his guitar and said that he needed a fuzz box. The producer suggested that he borrow one from the Buffalo Springfield who were recording in the next studio. Krieger shrugged. Morrison sat down again on the leather couch and leaned back. He lit a match. He studied the flame a while and then very slowly, very deliberately, lowered it to the fly of his black vinyl pants. Manzarek watched him. The girl who was rubbing Manzarek's shoulders did not look at anyone. There was a sense that no one was going to leave the room, ever. It would be some weeks before the Doors finished recording this album. I did not see it through. Four. Someone once brought Janis Joplin to a party at the house on Franklin Avenue. She had just done a concert, and she wanted brandy and benedictine in a water tumbler. Music people never wanted ordinary drinks. They wanted sake or champagne cocktails or tequila neat. Spending time with music people was confusing and required a more fluid and ultimately a more passive approach than I ever acquired. In the first place, time was never of the essence. We would have dinner at nine, unless we had it at 11.30 or we could order in late. We would go down to USC to see the living theatre if the limo came at the very moment when no one had just made a drink or a cigarette or an arrangement to meet Ultraviolet at the Montecito. In any case, David Hockney was coming by. In any case, Ultraviolet was not at the Montecito. In any case, we would go down to USC and see the living theatre tonight or we would see the Living Theatre another night, in New York or Prague. First, we wanted sushi for 20, steamed clams, vegetable vindaloo, and many rum drinks with gardenias for our hair. First, we wanted a table for 12, 14 at the most, although there might be 6 more, or 8 more, or 11 more. There would never be 1 or 2 more, because... Music people did not travel in groups of one or two. John and Michelle Phillips, on their way to the hospital for the birth of their daughter, China, had the limo detour into Hollywood in order to pick up a friend, Anne Marshall. This incident, which I often embroider in my mind to include an imaginary second detour to the luau for gardenias, exactly describes the music business to me. Around five o'clock on the morning of October 28, 1967, in the desolate district between San Francisco Bay and the Oakland Estuary that the Oakland police call Beat 101A, a 25-year-old black militant named Huey P. Newton was stopped and questioned by a white police officer named John Frey Jr. An hour later, Huey Newton was under arrest at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, where he had gone for emergency treatment of a gunshot wound in his stomach. And a few weeks later, he was indicted by the Alameda County Grand Jury on charges of murdering John Frey, wounding another officer, and kidnapping a bystander. In the spring of 1968, when Huey Newton was awaiting trial, I went to see him in the Alameda County Jail. I suppose I went because I was interested in the alchemy of issues, for an issue is what Huey Newton had by then become. To understand how that had happened, you must first consider Huey Newton, who he was. He came from an Oakland family, and for a while he went to Merritt College. In October of 1966, he and a friend named Bobby Seal 
organised what they called the Black Panther Party. They borrowed the name from the emblem used by the Freedom Party in Lowndes County, Alabama, and from the beginning, they defined themselves as a revolutionary political group. The Oakland police knew the Panthers, and had a list of the twenty or so Panther cars. I am telling you neither that Huey Newton killed John Frey, nor that Huey Newton did not kill John Frey. For in the context of revolutionary politics, Huey Newton's guilt or innocence was irrelevant. I am telling you only how Huey Newton happened to be in the Alameda County Jail, and why rallies were held in his name, demonstrations organised whenever he appeared in courts. Let's spring Huey, the buttons read, fifty cents each, and here and there on the courthouse steps, among the panthers with their berets and sunglasses, the chants would go up. Get your M31, cause baby we're gonna have some fun. Boom, 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 boom. Fight on, brother, a woman would add in the spirit of a good-natured amen. Bang, bang. Bullshit, bullshit, can't stand the game, white man's playing. One way out, one way out, boom, 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 boom. In the corridor downstairs in the Alameda County Courthouse, there was a crush of lawyers and CBC correspondents and cameramen and people who wanted to visit Huey. Eldridge doesn't mind if I go up, one of the latter said to one of the lawyers. If Eldridge doesn't mind, it's all right with me, the lawyer said, if you've got press credentials. I've got kind of dubious credentials. I can't take you up then. Eldridge has got dubious credentials. One's bad enough. I've got a good working relationship up there. I don't want to blow it. The lawyer turned to a cameraman. You guys rolling yet? On that particular day, I was allowed to go up, and a Los Angeles Times man and a radio newscaster. We all signed for police register and sat around a scarred pine table and waited for Huey Newton. The only thing that's going to free Huey Newton, Rat Brown had said recently at a pamphlet rally in Oakland Auditorium, is gunpowder. Huey Newton laid down his life for us. Stokely Carmichael had said that same night. But, of course, Huey Newton had not yet laid down his life at all. Was just here, in the Alameda County Jail, waiting to be tried. And I wondered if the direction these rallies were taking ever made him uneasy, ever made him suspect that in many ways he was more useful to the revolution behind bars than on the street. He seemed, when he finally came in, an extremely likeable young man, engaging, direct, and I did not get the sense that he had intended to become a political martyr. He smiled at us all and waited for his lawyer, Charles Gary, to set up a tape recorder, and he chatted softly with Eldridge Cleaver, who was then the Black Panther's Minister of Information. Huey Newton was still the Minister of Defence. Eldridge Cleaver wore a black sweater and one gold earring and spoke in an almost inaudible drawl and was allowed to see Huey Newton because he had those dubious credentials, a press card from Ramparts. Actually, his interest was in getting statements from Huey Newton, messages to take outside, in receiving a kind of prophecy to be interpreted as needed. We need a statement, Huey, about the 10-point program, Eldridge Cleaver said. So I'll ask you a question, see, and you answer it. How's Bobby? Huey Newton asked. He's got a hearing on his misdemeanors, see. I thought he had a felony. Ah, well, that's another thing, the felony. He's also got a couple of misdemeanors. Once Charles Gary had set up the tape recorder, Huey Newton stopped chatting 
and started lecturing, almost without pause. He talked, running the words together because he had said them so many times before, about the American capitalistic materialistic system and so-called free enterprise and the fight for the liberation of black people throughout the world. Every now and then, Eldridge Cleaver would signal Huey Newton and say something like, There are a lot of people interested in the executive mandate number three you've issued to the Black Panther Party, Huey. Care to comment? And Huey Newton would comment. Yes, mandate number three is this demand from the Black Panther Party speaking for the black community. Within the mandate, we admonish the racist police force. I kept wishing that he would talk about himself, hoping to break through the wall of rhetoric. But he seemed to be one of those autodidacts for whom all things specific and personal present themselves as minefields to be avoided, even at the cost of coherence, for whom safety lies in generalization. The newspaper man, the radio man, they tried. Q. Tell us something about yourself, Huey. I mean, your life before the Panthers. A. Before the Black Panther Party, my life was very similar to that of most black people in this country. Q. Well, your family. Some incidents you remember. The influences that shaped you. A. Living in America shaped me. Q. Well, yes, but more specifically... A. It reminds me of a quote from James Baldwin. To be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. To be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. Eldridge Cleaver wrote in large letters on a pad of paper. And then he added, Huey P. Newton quoting James Baldwin. I could see it emblazoned above the speaker's platform at a rally, imprinted on the letterhead of an ad hoc committee still unborn. As a matter of fact, almost everything Huey Newton said had the ring of being a quotation, a pronouncement to be employed when the need arose. I had heard Huey P. Newton on racism. The Black Panther Party is against racism. Huey P. Newton on cultural nationalism. The Black Panther Party believes that the only culture worth holding on to is revolutionary culture. Huey P. Newton on white radicalism, on police occupation of the ghetto, on the European versus the African. The European started to be sick when he denied his sexual nature, Huey Newton said. And Charles Gary interrupted then, bringing it back to first principles. Isn't it true, though, Huey, he said, that racism got its start for economic reasons? This weird interlocution seemed to take on a life of its own. The small room was hot, and the fluorescent light hurt my eyes, and I still did not know to what extent Huey Newton understood the nature of the role in which he was cast. As it happened, I had always appreciated the logic of the Panther position, based as it was on the proposition that political power began at the end of the barrel of a gun. Open brackets. Exactly what gun had even been specified in an early memorandum from Huey P. Newton. Army, 45, carbine, 12-gauge magnum shotgun with 18-inch barrel, preferably the brand of high standard, M16, 357 Magnum Pistols, P38, close brackets. And I could appreciate, as well, the particular beauty in Huey Newton as issue. In the politics of revolution, everyone was expendable. But I doubted that Huey Newton's political sophistication extended to seeing himself that way. The value of a Scottsboro case is easier to see if you are not yourself the Scottsboro boy. Is there anything else you want to ask, Huey? Charles Gary asked. There did not seem to be. 
The lawyer adjusted his tape recorder. I've had a request, Huey, he said, from a high school student, a reporter on his school paper, and he wanted a statement from you, and he's going to call me tonight. Care to give me a message for him? Huey Newton regarded the microphone. There was a moment in which he seemed not to remember the name of the play, and then he brightened. I would like to point out, he said, his voice gaining volume as the memory discs clicked, High school, student, youth, message to you. That America is becoming a very young nation. Quote. I heard a moaning and a groaning, and I went over, and it was... This Negro fellow was there. He had been shot in the stomach, and at the time he didn't appear in any acute distress, and so I said I'd see. I asked him if he was a Kaiser. He belonged to Kaiser, and he said, Yes, yes, get a doctor. Can't you see I'm bleeding? I've been shot. Now get someone out here. And I asked him if he had his Kaiser card. And he got upset at this, and he said, Come on, get a doctor out here. I've been shot. I said, I see this, but you're not in any acute distress. So I told him we'd have to check to make sure he was a member. And this kind of upset him more, and he called me a few nasty names and said, Now get a doctor out here right now, I've been shot and I'm bleeding. And he took his coat off and his shirt, he threw it on the desk there, and he said, Can't you see all this blood? And I said, I see it. And it wasn't that much. And so I said, Well, you'll have to sign our admission sheet before you can be seen by a doctor. And he said, I'm not signing anything. And I said, you cannot be seen by a doctor unless you sign the admission sheet. And he said, I don't have to sign anything. And a few more choice words. End quote. This is an excerpt from the testimony before the Alameda County Grand Jury of Corrine Leonard, the nurse in charge of the Kaiser Foundation Hospital Emergency Room in Oakland at 5.30 a.m. on October 28, 1967. The Negro fellow was, of course, Huey Newton, wounded that morning during the gunfire which killed John Frey. For a long time, I kept a copy of this testimony pinned to my office wall on the theory that it illustrated a collision of cultures, a classic instance of an historical outsider confronting the established order at its most petty and impenetrable level. This theory was shattered when I learned that Huey Newton was, in fact, an enrolled member of the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, i.e., in Nurse Leonard's words, a Kaiser. 6. One morning in 1968, I went to see Eldridge Cleaver in the San Francisco apartment he then shared with his wife, Kathleen. To be admitted to this apartment, it was necessary to ring first, and then stand in the middle of Oak Street, at a place which could be observed clearly from the Cleaver's apartment. After this scrutiny, the visitor was, or was not, buzzed in. I was, and I climbed the stairs to find Kathleen Cleaver in the kitchen frying sausage, and Eldridge Cleaver in the living room listening to a John Coltrane record, and a number of other people all over the apartment, people everywhere, people standing in doorways and people moving around in one another's peripheral vision and people making and taking telephone calls. When can you move on that? I would hear in the background and you can't bribe me with a dinner, man. Those guardian dinners are all old left, like a wake. Most of these other people were members of the Black Panther Party, but one of them in the living room was Eldridge Cleaver's parole officer. It seems to me that I stayed about an hour. It seems to me that the three of us, Eldridge Cleaver, his parole officer, and I, mainly discuss the commercial prospects of Soul on Ice, which, it happened, was being published that day. We discuss the advance, $5,000. We discuss the size of the first printing, 10,000 copies. We discuss the advertising budget, we discussed the bookstores and which copies were or were not available. It was a not 
unusual discussion between writers, with the difference that one of the writers had his parole officer there, and the other had stood out on Oak Street and been visually frisked before coming inside. 7. To pack and wear. Two skirts, two jerseys or leotards, one pullover sweater, two pair of shoes, stockings, bra, nightgown, robe, slippers, cigarettes, bourbon, bag with shampoo, toothbrush and paste, basis soap, razor deodorant, aspirin prescriptions, Tampax, face cream, powder, baby oil. To carry, mohair throw, typewriter, two legal pads and pens, files, house key. This is a list which was taped inside my closet door in Hollywood during those years when I was reporting more or less steadily. The list enabled me to pack without thinking for any piece I was likely to do. Notice the deliberate anonymity of costume. In a skirt, a leotard and stockings, I could pass on either side of the culture. Notice the mohair throw for trunkline flights, i.e. no blankets, and for the motel room in which the air conditioning could not be turned off. Notice the bourbon for the same motel room. Notice the typewriter for the airport coming home. The idea was to turn in the Hertz car, check in, find an empty bench, and start typing the day's notes. It should be clear that this was a list made by someone who prized control, yearned after momentum, someone determined to play her role as if she had the script, heard her cues, knew the narrative. There is on this list one significant omission, one article I needed and never had, a watch. I needed a watch not during the day when I could turn on the car radio or ask someone, but at night in the motel. Quite often I would ask the desk for the time every half hour or so, until finally, embarrassed to ask again, I would call Los Angeles and ask my husband. In other words, I had skirts, jerseys, leotards, pullover sweater, shoes, stockings, bra, nightgown, robe, slippers, cigarettes, bourbon, shampoo, toothbrush and paste, basis soap, razor, deodorant, aspirin prescriptions, Tampax, face cream, powder, baby oil, mohair throw, typewriter, legal pads, pens, files and a house key. But I didn't know what time it was. This may be a parable, either of my life as a reporter during this period, or of the period itself. 8. Driving a budget rental car between Sacramento and San Francisco one rainy morning in November of 1968, I kept the radio on very loud. On this occasion I kept the radio on very loud, not to find out what time it was, but in an effort to erase six words from my mind. Six words which had no significance for me, but which seemed that year to signal the onset of anxiety or fright. The words, a line from Ezra Pound's In a Station of the Metro, were these. Petals on a wet black bow. The radio played with Cheetah Lineman, and I heard it on the grapevine. Petals on a wet black bow. Somewhere between the Yolo Causeway and Vallejo, it occurred to me that during the course of any given week, I met too many people who spoke favorably about bombing power stations. Somewhere between the Yolo Causeway and Vallejo, it also occurred to me that the fright on this particular morning was going to present itself as an inability to drive this budget rental car across the Carquinas Bridge. The Wichita lineman was still on the job. I closed my eyes and drove across the Carquinas Bridge.
because I had appointments, because I was working, because I had promised to watch the revolution being made at San Francisco State College, and because there was no place in Vallejo to turn in a budget rent a car, and because nothing on my mind was in the script as I remembered it. 9. At San Francisco State College, on that particular morning, the wind was blowing the cold rain in squalls across the muddied lawns and against the lighted windows of empty classrooms. In the days before, there had been fires set when classes invaded, and finally a confrontation with the San Francisco Police Tactical Unit, and in the weeks to come the campus would become what many people on it were pleased to call a battlefield. The police and the mace and the noon arrest would become the routine of life on the campus, and every night the combatants would review their day on television. The waves of students advancing, the commotion at the edge of the frame, the riot sticks flashing, the instant of jerky camera that served to suggest at what risk the film was obtained. Then a cut to the weather map. In the beginning, there had been the necessary issue, the suspension of a 22-year-old instructor who happened as well to be Minister of Education for the Black Panther Party. But that issue, like most, had soon ceased to be the point in the minds of even the most dense participants. Disorder was its own point. I had never before been on a campus in disorder, had missed even Berkeley and Columbia, and I suppose I went to San Francisco State expecting something other than what I found there. In some not at all trivial sense, the set was wrong. The very architecture of California State Colleges tends to deny radical notions, to reflect instead a modest and hopeful vision of progressive welfare bureaucracy. And as I walked across the campus that day, and on later days, the entire San Francisco state dilemma, the gradual politicization, the issues here and there, the obligatory 15 demands, the continual arousal of the police and the outraged citizenry, seemed increasingly off-key. An instance of the Enfant Terrible and the Board of Trustees unconsciously collaborating on a wishful fantasy, revolution on campus, and playing it out in time for the six o'clock news. Adjet prop committee meeting in the Redwood Room, read a scrawled note on the cafeteria door one morning. Only someone who needed very badly to be alarmed could respond with force to a guerrilla band that not only announced its meetings on the enemy's bulletin board, but seemed innocent of the spelling and so the meaning of the words it used. Hitler Hayakawa, some of the faculty had begun calling S.I. Hayakawa, the semanticist who had become the college's third president in a year, and had incurred considerable displeasure by trying to keep the campus open. Eichmann, Kay Boyle had screamed at him at a rally. In just such broad strokes was the picture being painted in the fall of 1968, on the pastoral campus at San Francisco State. The place simply never seemed serious. The headlines were dark that first day. The college had been closed, quote, indefinitely. Both Ronald Reagan and Jesse Unruh were threatening reprisals. Still, the climate inside the administration building was that of a musical comedy about college life. No chance will be open tomorrow, secretaries informed callers. Go skiing, have a good time. Striking black militants dropped in to chat with the deans. Striking white radicals exchanged gossip in the corridors. No interviews, no press, announced a student strike leader who happened into a dean's office where I was sitting. In the next moment, he was piqued because no one had told him that a Huntley-Brinkley camera crew was on campus. 
We can still plug into that, the dean said soothingly. Everyone seemed joined in a rather festive camaraderie, a shared jargon, a shared sense of moment. The future was no longer arduous and indefinite, but immediate and programmatic, a glow with the prospect of problems to be, quote, addressed, plans to be, quote, implemented. It was agreed all around that the confrontations could be a very healthy development, and maybe it took a shutdown to get something done. The mood, like the architecture, was 1948 functional, a model of pragmatic optimism. Perhaps Evelyn War could have gotten it down exactly right. War was good at scenes of industrious self-delusion, scenes of people absorbed in odd games. Here at San Francisco State, only the black militants could be construed as serious. They were at any rate picking the games, dictating the rules, and taking what they could from what seemed for everyone else just an amiable evasion of routine, of institutional anxiety, of the tedium of the academic calendar. Meanwhile, the administrators could talk about programs. Meanwhile, the white radicals could see themselves on an investment of virtually nothing as urban guerrillas. It was working out well for everyone, this game at San Francisco State, and its peculiar virtues had never been so clear to me as they became one afternoon when I sat in on a meeting of 50 or 60 SDS members. They had called a press conference for later that day, and now they were discussing just what the format of the press conference should be. This has to be on our terms, someone warned, because they'll ask very leading questions. They'll ask questions. Make them submit any questions in writing, someone else suggested. The Black Student Union does that very successfully, then they just don't answer anything they don't want to answer. That's it, don't fall into their trap. Something we should stress at this press conference is who owns the media. You don't think it's common knowledge that the papers represent corporate interests? A realist among them interjected doubtfully. I don't think it's understood. Two hours and several dozen handboats later, the group had selected four members to tell the press who owned the media, had decided to appear en masse at an opposition press conference, and had debated various slogans for the next day's demonstration. Let's see, first we have Hearst tells it like it ain't, then stop press distortion. That's the one there was some political controversy about. And before they broke up, they had listened to a student who had driven up for the day from the College of San Mateo, a junior college down on the peninsula from San Francisco. Quote, I came up here today with some third world students to tell you that we're with you, and we hope that you'll be with us when we try to pull off a strike next week, because we're really into it. We carry our motorcycle helmets all the time, can't think, can't go to class, end quote. He had paused. He was a nice-looking boy, and fired with his task. I considered the tender melancholy of life in San Mateo, which is one of the richest counties per capita in the United States of America. And I considered whether or not the Wichita linemen and the petals on the wet black bow represented the aimlessness of the bourgeoisie. And I considered the illusion of aim to be gained by holding a press conference. The only problem with press conferences being that the press asks questions. I'm here to tell you that at College of San Mateo, we're living like revolutionaries, the boy said then. 10. We put Lay Lady Lay on the record player and Suzanne. We went down to Melrose Avenue to see the flying burritos. There was a jasmine vine grown over the veranda of the big house on Franklin Avenue, and in the evenings the smell of jasmine came in through all the open doors and windows. I made booyah bess for people who did not eat meat. 
I imagined that my own life was simple and sweet, and sometimes it was, but there were odd things going around town. There were rumours, there were stories. Everything was unmentionable, but nothing was unimaginable. This mystical flirtation with the idea of sin, this sense that it was possible to go too far and that many people were doing it, was very much with us in Los Angeles in 1968 and 1969. A demented and seductive vortical tension was building in the community. The jitters were setting in. I recall a time when the dogs barked every night and the moon was always full. On August 9th, 1969, I was sitting in the shallow end of my sister-in-law's swimming pool in Beverly Hills and she received a telephone call from a friend who had just heard about the murders at Sharon Tate Polanski's house on Cielo Drive. The phone rang many times during the next hour. These early reports were garbled and contradictory. One caller would say hoods, the next would say chains. There were twenty dead, no, twelve, ten, eighteen. Black masses were imagined and bad trips blamed. I remember all of the day's misinformation very clearly, and I also remember this, and wish I did not. I remember that no one was surprised. 11. When I first met Linda Kasabian in the summer of 1970, she was wearing her hair parted neatly in the middle, no makeup, Elizabeth Arden bluegrass perfume, and the unpressed blue uniform issued to inmates of the Sybil Brand Institute for Women in Los Angeles. She was at Sybil Brand in protective custody waiting out the time until she could testify about the murders of Sharon Tate Polanski, Abigail Folger, Jay Sebring, Wojtek Rakowski, Stephen Parent, and Rosemary and Leno Labianca. And with her lawyer, Gary Fleischman, I spent a number of evenings talking to her there. Of these evenings, I remember mainly my dread at entering the prison, at leaving for even an hour the infinite possibilities I suddenly perceived in the summer twilight. I remember driving downtown on the Hollywood freeway in Gary Fleischman's Cadillac convertible with the top down. I remember watching a rabbit graze on the grass by the gate as Gary Fleischman signed the prison register. Each of the half-dozen doors that locked behind us as we entered Civil Brand was a little death, and I would emerge after the interview like Persephone from the underworld, euphoric, elated. Once home, I would have two drinks and make myself a hamburger and eat it ravenously. Dig it, Gary Fleischman was always saying. One night when we were driving back to Hollywood from Sybil Brand in the Cadillac convertible with the top down, he demanded that I tell him the population of India I said that I did not know the population of India. Take a guess, he prompted. I made a guess, absurdly low, and he was disgusted. He had asked the same question of his niece, a college girl, of Linda, and now of me, and none of us had known. It seemed to confirm some idea he had of women, their essential ineducability, a similarity under the skin. Gary Fleischman was someone of a type I met only rarely, a comic realist in a pork pie hat, a business traveller on the far frontiers of the period, a man who knew his way around the courthouse and civil brand and remained cheerful, even jaunty, in the face of the awesome and impenetrable mystery at the centre of what he called the case. In fact, we never talked about the case and referred to its central events only as Cielo Drive and La Bianca. We talked instead about Linda's childhood pastimes and disappointments, her high school romances and her concern for her children. This particular juxtaposition of the spoken and the unspeakable 
was eerie and unsettling, and made my notebook a litany of little ironies so obvious as to be of interest only to dedicated absurdists. An example, Linda dreamed of opening a combination restaurant boutique and pet shop. 12. Certain organic disorders of the central nervous system are characterized by periodic remissions, the apparent complete recovery of the afflicted nerves. What happens appears to be this. As the lining of a nerve becomes inflamed and hardens into scar tissue, thereby blocking the passage of neural impulses, the nervous system gradually changes its circuitry, finds other unaffected nerves to carry the same messages. During the years when I found it necessary to revise the circuitry of my mind, I discovered that I was no longer interested in whether the woman on the ledge outside the window on the 16th floor jumped or did not jump, or in why. I was interested only in the picture of her in my mind, her hair incandescent in the floodlights, her bare toes curled inward on the stone ledge. In this light, all narrative was sentimental. In this light, all connections were equally meaningful and equally senseless. Try these. On the morning of John Kennedy's death in 1963, I was buying at Ranserhoff's in San Francisco a short silk dress in which to be married. A few years later, this dress of mine was ruined when, at a dinner party in Bel Air, Roman Polanski accidentally spilled a glass of red wine on it. Sharon Tate was also a guest at this party, although she and Rowan Polanski were not yet married. On July 27, 1970, I went to the Magnin High shop on the third floor of I. Magnin in Beverly Hills and picked out, at Linda Kasabian's request, the dress in which she began her testimony about the murders at Sharon Tate Polanski's house on Cielo Drive. Size 9 Petite, her instructions read. Mini, but not extremely mini, in velvet if possible, emerald green or gold. Or, a Mexican peasant-style dress, smocked or embroidered. She needed the dress that morning because the district attorney, Vincent Bugliosi, had expressed doubts about the dress she had planned to wear, a long white homespun shift. Long is for evening, he had advised Linda. Long was for evening, and white was for brides. At her own wedding in 1965, Linda Kasabian had worn a white brocade suit. Time passed, times changed. Everything was to teach us something. At 11.20 on that July morning in 1970, I delivered the dress in which she would testify to Gary Fleischman, who was waiting in front of his office on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. He was wearing his pork pie hat, and he was standing with Linda's second husband, Bob Kasabian, and their friend, Charlie Melton, both of whom were wearing long white robes. Long was for Bob and Charlie. The dress in the I. Magnin box was for Linda. The three of them took the I. Magnin box and got into Gary Fleischmann's Cadillac convertible with the top down and drove off in the sunlight toward the freeway downtown, waving back at me. I believe this to be an authentically senseless chain of correspondences. But, in the jingle-jangle morning of that summer, it made as much sense as anything else did. Thirteen. I recall a conversation I had in 1970 with the manager of a motel in which I was staying near Pendleton, Oregon. I had been doing a piece for life about the storage of VX and GB nerve gas at an army arsenal in Umatilla County, and now I was done and trying to check out of the motel. During the course of checking out, I was asked this question by the manager, who was a Mormon. If you can't believe you're going to heaven in your own body, and on a first-name basis of all the members of your family, and what's the point of dying? 
At that time, I believed that my basic affective controls were no longer intact. But now I present this to you as a more cogent question than it might at first appear. A kind of Cohen of the period. 14. Once I had a rib broken, and during the few months that it was painful to turn in bed or raise my arms in a swimming pool, I had, for the first time, a sharp apprehension of what it would be like to be old. Later I forgot. At some point during the years I am talking about here, after a series of periodic visual disturbances, three electroencephalograms, two complete sets of skull and neck x-rays, one five-hour glucose tolerance test, two electromyelograms, a battery of chemical tests and consultations with two ophthalmologists, one internist, and three neurologists. I was told that the disorder was not really in my eyes, but in my central nervous system. I might or might not experience symptoms of neural damage all my life. These symptoms which might or might not appear might or might not involve my eyes. They might or might not involve my arms or legs. They might or might not be disabling. Their effects might be lessened by cortisone injections, or they might not. It could not be predicted. The condition had a name, the kind of name usually associated with telephones. But the name meant nothing, and the neurologist did not like to use it. The name was multiple sclerosis, but the name had no meaning. This was, the neurologist said, an exclusionary diagnosis and meant nothing. I had at this time a sharp apprehension, not of what it was like to be old, but of what it was like to open the door to the stranger and find that the stranger did indeed have the knife. In a few lines of dialogue in a neurologist's office in Beverly Hills, the improbable had become the probable, the norm. Things which happened only to other people could in fact happen to me. I could be struck by lightning, could dare to eat a peach and be poisoned by the cyanide in the stone. The startling fact was this. My body was offering a precise physiological equivalent to what had been going on in my mind. Lead a simple life, the neurologist advised. Not that it makes any difference we know about. In other words, it was another story without a narrative. 15. Many people I know in Los Angeles believe that the 60s ended abruptly on August 9, 1969, ended at the exact moment when word of the murders on Cielo Drive travelled like brush fire through the community. And in a sense, this is true. The tension broke that day. The paranoia was fulfilled. In another sense, the 60s did not truly end for me until January of 1971, when I left the house on Franklin Avenue and moved to a house on the sea. This particular house on the sea had itself been very much a part of the 60s, and for some months after we took possession, I would come across souvenirs of that period in its history. A piece of Scientology literature beneath a draw lining. A copy of Stranger in a Strange Land stuck deep on a closet shelf. But after a while we did some construction. And between the power saws and the sea wind, the place got exorcised. I have known, since then, very little about the movements of the people who seem to me emblematic of those years. I know, of course, that Eldridge Cleaver went to Algeria and came home an entrepreneur. I know that Jim Morrison died in Paris. I know that Linda Kasabian fled in search of the pastoral to New Hampshire, where I once visited her. She also visited me in New York, and we took our children on the Staten Island Ferry to see the Statue of Liberty. 
I also know that in 1975, Paul Ferguson, while serving a life sentence for the murder of Ramon Novaro, won first prize in a PEN fiction contest and announced plans to, quote, continue my writing. Writing had helped him, he said, to, quote, reflect on experience and see what it means. Quite often I reflect on the big house in Hollywood, on Midnight Confessions, and on Ramon Navarro, and on the fact that Rowan Polanski and I are godparents to the same child. But writing has not yet helped me to see what it means. <laughs>